Death's Door captures the Tim Burton-esque juxtaposition of a world that's both fatalistically grim, yet pleasantly delightful in such a lavish way. There's such a gruesome tone to combat. The enemies will splatter their blood across the walls and break out in red cracks that represent their threshold for pain. Then they make this wet, gurgling sound as they die, and then lifelessly slump to the floor. And then, the most disturbing part is, they stay there. Even in the newer Doom games, the mangled corpses of your enemies will fade away once the unlife has been sufficiently stomped out of them. But in Death's Door, your fallen foes simply stay contorted corpses, giving you this hollow feeling of victory. The fixed camera bolsters this feeling. Once you've defeated an enemy in a third person game, you'll quickly move your camera to your next foe and really, if ever, look upon the chaos you have sown. Yet in Death's Door, once the battle is done, you're forced to stand amongst the bodies of the creature's souls that you've just reaped, giving the fighter fruitless air. Though should you be the one to fall in battle, you're presented with a bold, bulky death that trembled with rage at my failure, stained in my own blood, and followed by a music sting that went from grand to melancholy in two seconds. Speaking of the music, this is far and above what I'd ever expect from an indie game. There's such a fantastic range, from somber flute melodies sailing in the wind, to remixes of the studio's previous game Titan Souls, giving the action track a more mystic vibe. Crowned with a song that's the best indie boss fight track since Megalomania, King of the Swamp erupts with an orchestral rendition of tragedy, then jumps to the bongos to keep the player sharp with constant percussion. Then there's this rapid transition that blends the music of both synthetic and physical instruments. It's a shame it's wasted on such a bad boss fight though. So yes, the world of Death's Door is grim, but it has an undeniable charm to it. Although not immediately apparent, the cute themes are far more subdued in the faint colours of the art style. Firstly, the protagonist. While I won't comment on his design, as that would be for a story review, his animations make him so uncannily like a natural bird. The single frame animations of his head tilt, constantly looking around as wild birds would, coupled with the sporadic blinking, the way feathers slip off his coat as he dodge rolls, it's so eerily similar. I find it creepy, but I do find most birds creepy. But I understand the majority find him cute, which I can see, it's just not an opinion that I have of this feathered reaper. Then there's this absurdist attempt at visual comedy in the game. These slashable signposts reflect the damage done to them when read. It's such an unexpected moment that it forces a laugh out of surprise. It's a delightful way to add some much needed levity to the ghastly environments. It feels like an idea that Nintendo would come up with for Skyward Sword, as the manual slashes would have allowed for sign artwork from the community. The level design of Death's Door feels so vast. The game arenas are often flat and expansive, making the world feel open despite being played out in a linear fashion. And I adore how the game will open up shortcuts from previous checkpoints rather than creating new ones. It shows a deep understanding of interconnected level design when designing these dungeons. It's such a rewarding feeling to push a button that creates a path behind you to your last checkpoint, and you know that you never have to repeat that area of the game again. Although, during the game's exploration, the isometric camera holds it back. In third person games, when players want to go somewhere, it's often because they'll see that place off in the distance and make their journey there themselves. The isometric camera in Death's Door means it's impossible to make discoveries like that, because the player can only see their immediate surroundings. What's worse is that the areas are laid out like dungeons in Zelda, which means getting lost. The 2D Zeldas that inspired Death's Door supplemented this problem by having a map for each dungeon, as it was hard for players to remember the rooms they had seen. Death's Door foregoes a map, making the players commit its world to memory, this can be frustrating in areas as big as these, making times when you're trying to reach a specific place annoying. As I said, Death Store is a linear game, but it's linear in the sense that Tomb Raider 2013 is linear, 
because it's a linear open world game, only now without a map. While Death's Door should definitely be praised for packing so many secrets and side challenges into this world, it never just leaves something lying around for you to pick up, you always have to look. But the problem with these side challenges is that when combined with the isometric camera and no map, it's easy to mistake side challenges for the critical path. The worst example is here. I assumed this small ladder was an optional route, and the critical path forward was the way the sign was pointing, towards danger. Wrong. The pathway with the sign was in fact the optional challenge, and what's worse is that it was one of the most challenging parts of the game. The challenge itself is well designed, it's a test of both speed and precision, but this layout made me think I was forced to complete a task that was so tricky. My favourite areas of the game are the Hall of Doors and the Witch's Mansion. I expected the mansion to be decrepit with creatures crawling out of the shadows to attack, like Resident Evil 7. But to my surprise, the mansion had far more in common with Resident Evil Village. It had a grand hall and was decorated with ceramics. It was like getting a look inside the witch's mind, and I saw a lot of Lady Dimitrescu in the witch. Psychologically, of course, definitely not physically. But my number one favourite location was the hub, the Hall of Doors. Unlike the rest of the world, the Hall of Doors has no hints of cuteness. Instead, it depicts a place where birds will be forced to work in an unceasing harvest of lives for all eternity. An infinite routine of paperwork and filings, with as much joy as there is colour. A place choked with the existential dread of the monotony of autonomy.